Hello and welcome to your official Fight Week UFC 292 live weigh-in show. I'm Caroline Pierce and I'm delighted to be joined by Nick Pete and the Hall of Famer himself, Michael Bisping. Gentlemen, how are you doing? And first of all, early thoughts, Mike, on what's set to be a really exciting night tomorrow. Early thoughts is that it's way too early because it's like five o'clock in the morning here in California, but uh, very excited for this fight card tomorrow night. Early thoughts are apparently to a tweet from Nick P. Sugar Sean O'Malley is already on weight, a true professional. Tempers are flaring so far in Boston. It's going to be a great night as, uh, as always. Well, that's good to hear. Already on weight, hopefully be on the scale up nice and early. But Nick, this is your favourite city, you told us, Boston, earlier this week. So far for myself, I've just seen grey skies since I've arrived. But the fighters, they've certainly brightened up the place and turned up in style, haven't they? You can tell, Caroline, you know, I don't know whether the light's off in your hotel room there or it's really it's really <laughs> glum outside. There's no sunshine. You're kind of in the dark. But yeah, listen, it's been a fantastic fight week. Some of the interviews coming out of Boston have been unreal. Of course, we've got two completely captivating title fights in the main event. But I tell you what, is it just me or has Ian Gary stole the show so far this week? He's been incredible. Well, Ian Gary did say to us, he said he feels like he's carrying this card on his shoulders. We'll get into that in a little in a little bit. I'm sure there'll be some thoughts on that. But let's get to the, the main event. Aljamain Sterling defending his title for the fourth time up against um, Sean O'Malley, his first title attempt. This is that classic grappler versus striker matchup, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I mean, listen, uh, Nick can say that Ian Gary's the king of Boston, but I'm pretty sure I heard chants of sugar Sean O'Malley throughout the entirety of the press conference. Uh, it's going to be, a, as you say, a captivating fight, but if we see here Al Jermaine Sterling, look at what he's capable of, the wrestling ability that this man has. There he is against Cejudo, picking him apart from the outside, and then when he chooses to go in, taking down the Olympic gold medalist. And he's going to need that because O'Malley on the feet is a dynamic striker. He's got excellent power. Of course, yesterday, Aljamain Sterling's picking apart the quality of opponent. But that guy right there, the last person that he beat, Piotr Jan, a former champion, stylistically a tough matchup as well. So that proves this is going to be a tougher fight than what Aljamain Sterling actually believes. Here they are weighing in. Al Jermaine was on great form, hyping up the crowd, talking a lot of smack, saying that Sean O'Malley's got Dana White privilege. He hasn't fought real opponents. And <laughs> tomorrow night, he's going to find out. Well, that was the press conference. And it was it was quite a rowdy affair in some ways, Nick. And I feel that Al Jermaine Sterling is really playing the heel, isn't he, this week? Yeah, and it's a role he's comfortable in as well. You know, for a long time, he did play the heel. He's, it's unusual with fighters sometimes. Sometimes fighters resonate with fans and pick up this huge wave of support wherever they go. And then other fighters, for some reason, the face just doesn't fit. And sometimes it's a little bit like that with Al Jermaine Sterling. Of course, the way he won the title didn't sit right with fans. But he's put that right. And he's had incredible wins since. Now, look at the record there. Now, a lot more fights than Sean O'Malley. The, the, the height difference is what everyone's talking about. O'Malley having the range on him. But actually, when you look at the reach, there's not really much in it. And as I say, when it comes to big fight experience, it's not even close. It's Al Jermaine Sterling all day. My only concern for Al Joe here is, unlike with those other fights, even the title defences, you know, when you're going in against former champions, popular fighters like TJ, going back in with Peter Potter, Jan, people like that, I don't think he was he was necessarily the favourite because of that consensus of fans. He's the overriding favourite going into this fight tomorrow night, and that means he's on dangerous ground because when you're the favourite, when you're breaking records, when you're you know the most defences in bantamweight history, and you're talking about going up and adding to your legacy by going to a new weight division, that's when you take your eye off the ball, and that's when it becomes dangerous, and that's the opportunity that awaits Sean O'Malley. Which I'm sure he wants to capitalise on. But Mike, is this really a case of who imposes their will first? You know, if Al Jermaine leans into his wrestling, which most of us expected do so, if Sean O'Malley can find the chin and keep it on the feet, is it really a case of whoever imposes their will and their game plan is the one that will come out victorious in this? 
I mean, to a certain degree, all fights are kind of like that. But you've got to remember, this is a five-round fight. So every round, the start of every round is essentially the start of a new fight. If uh, Sugar Sean O'Malley gets taken down and controlled early, he can reset at the single start of every round. So uh, simplistically, yes. And as you say, it is kind of striker versus grappler. And O'Malley, you know, he's, he, as I said on the preview show, he's got to have lateral movement. He's got to circle a lot. He can't allow himself to get backed up against the fence. But if he can fight for underhooks, sprawl and brawl, keep the fight on the feet, we got a very, very interesting fight on our hands because O'Malley on the feet is beautiful to watch. I love the way he switches stances, the boxing combinations that he puts together are really nice to watch. Fast hands, brutal hands, lots of power. But again, the real question and the real fight is, can he keep the fight on the feet? We're going to find out tomorrow night. We certainly are. And, and Nick, look, a lot of lot of talk this week, even from Sean O'Malley, about Aljamain being potentially the greatest bantamweight of all time. And I, I wonder whether Sean's been saying that a lot so that if or when he beats him, he's like, well, what does that make me? First off, would you say that Aljo, in your opinion, is the greatest bantamweight of all time? And, and therefore, where does that put Sean if he, if he gets the win? Yeah, listen, absolutely. Uh, you know, statistics speak for themselves. As again, he may not be the most popular bantamweight we've ever seen, but he's made more title defences than anybody else in this division. Of course, this division has only had a certain number of champions because it's been a, a little bit of a hot potato at times. But we, it has had some great champions in there. Dominic Cruz, of course, was a champion before he even came into the UFC and inherited the UFC belt. So I think there might be some work to do to catch up with Dominic Cruz still. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's hard to argue. And I understand and why Sean O'Malley's saying it because he wants to beat the guy that beat the man because if you beat the man then you become the man so I kind of like the way he's selling this narrative and also listen sometimes when you come in certainly as the underdog massaging the champion's ego a little bit letting them feel a little bit of a sense of security and then pouncing on him as soon as the bell goes yeah I like those tactics and I just love the way Sugar Sean is just so calm and composed this week, you know, the whole time. He's so used to all the media attention anyway, and he's just taking it all on his stride. But I want to move us on to the co-main event. I feel like this one's sort of flying under the radar a little bit. Zhang Wei Li defending her title, her strawweight belt, against Amanda Lemos. And um, I feel like both powerful strikers, um, but Wei Li, it just seems hard to imagine that she's going to lose this belt, in my opinion. But Mike, how do you see this one? Yeah, look, listen, as you say, maybe flying under the radar, but don't get that twisted. Zhang Weili is incredible to watch. It's as simple as that. She's so powerful. She's such a great athlete. And of course, skills to back it up. And she's beaten multiple champions. So it's 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 going to be a really fun one. I think the fact that there's a language barrier, she doesn't speak English. I think that holds things back, certainly at the press conferences. But even in like through the translation, I thought she's doing a great job. Amanda Lemos says she's going to drink up the water that Zhang Weili is. And then Lemos, uh, uh, Zhang's like, what do you mean? I'm the ocean. You can't drink the ocean. Never mind who's drinking what. Look at this on the feet. I mean, that's against uh, some great competition. Amanda Lemos has found the stoppage on more than one occasion. Great to watch. Big, big power in her hand, as was evident last time out against Amanda Lemos. Oh, sorry, pardon me, Marina Rodriguez. And here they are here. A lot of intensity between these two because they know what's stake. at stake. They know it's a tough fight. And I love that reference Whaley was saying to being like water and, you know, she's going to evolve and adapt as the fight goes on. But, but Nick, she really has shown such an evolution in her game. I feel like she's just getting better and better. Yeah, that little homage to Bruce Lee isn't lost, obviously, on martial arts fans. You know, she knew exactly what she was saying there. But you're right. You know, she just improves with every single fight, you know, and she's she really is a, a modern age female mixed martial artist in that she's strong in every department. She's super aggressive. She's got an entire nation behind her. You know, she's got the potential to become one of the biggest stars in the UFC once they truly unlock the pay-per-view potential of China, of course. But... To get to that point, she's got to keep ticking off these top contenders. And I agree with Mike. They don't come much tougher than Amanda Limos, who, because at 36 years of age, she knows, you know, with a lot of with a lot of fighters, you know, you may only get one shot at the title. But when you're 36 years of age, you can pretty much guarantee it. 
you know so she has got everything to lose in this fight and she knows she can't afford a bad night at the office that for me guarantees fireworks as you can see stylistically height wise reach wise very similar of course the champion's got a lot more big fight experience lemos will be in a big major five round fight in front of fans for the first time in their career a lot of pressure there but you know what look at look at the nose to nose they did yesterday at the media day she is not bothered one iota in fact Amanda Lemos looks like she is loving every second of it. Yeah, great to see. Now, a fight that we are looking forward to seeing. You talked about it earlier, Nick, is uh, Ian Gary up against Neil Magny. It was a change of opponent from Jeff Neal to Neil Magny on just 10 days out. But um, there's been a f some war of words going on between the two of them. It was Ian Gary's first press conference. He's on the main card of a pay-per-view. And um, he didn't waste any time in, in getting quite vocal Mike, about what he thought about uh, Neil Magny. Yeah, look, listen, you know, it's all fair in love and war. They're going to fight and uh, he's spicing things up a little bit. I think Ian Gary's doing a tremendous job at stirring the pot. He's bringing a lot of focus onto his fight. Uh, he's also winding up Neil Magnet very, 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 very much so. Pardon me. It's early. Uh, as I said, <laughs> um, we all saw the interview, I'm sure. Neil Magny went out there and he said, I'm going to put a beating on him like I've like, like a father needs to do to a son or whatever the exact words were. And I've got quite accustomed to handing out these whoopings. And I think what he meant was he meant beating his opponents. But listen, as I said, oh, fair in love and war. <laughs> Ian Gary's twisting it. He's winding him up. And that's a good idea because if you wind someone up, that's the exact purpose of why we engage in the so-called trash talk. It's psychological warfare. You're trying to wind them up. You're trying to get in their head. You're trying to throw them off the game plan, make them too aggressive, make them take risks, all these kind of things. And then, of course, as I said, up his own fight, bringing the spotlight onto him. So, listen, this is what we do. This is exactly what we're doing. If anyone's offended by it, then they need to go give the head a wobble because it's the fight game. They're going to try and knock each other out. And I'm very much looking forward to it now. Well, I feel like he certainly did rattle Neil Magny a little bit, which we don't often see. But in terms of the fight itself, Nick, we've got the up and comer, the undefeated in Ian Gary up against the, the man who's had the most wins in UFC welterweight history in Neil Magny. You know, the veteran versus the upcomer. How do you see this one going down, Nick? I think, you know, Ian's doing exactly the right thing because Neil, got, Neil Magny has made a career out of defeating fighters in a similar way, shape and form than Ian Gary. Coming through, great records, you know, young fighters with big expectations, big aspirations, and they look to get ranked and they run into Neil Magny and Neil Magny slams the door on them. And Magny's just one of those guys that isn't getting towards the title shot, but you better believe he protects that rank, those rankings like his, like his life depends on it. And what Ian's got to do is more of this, more of this. This is how he's lit the UFC up so far. This is why he's so entertaining. This is why he's got the fans talking all over the globe. It's because he's a finisher. And what I like about this fight, look, the animosity, this is the first time we've really seen this with Ian Gary. The first time we've seen him be aggressive on the microphone, try and wind his opponent up. And as Mike said, why is he doing that? He's going in against a wily veteran who's seen it all, done it all, got the T-shirts in his wardrobe, You've got to do something different. Everyone gets in with Neil Magny and goes, oh, respect to the veteran. I want his ranking. Appreciate the opportunity. No, man, Ian Gary's like, I'm going to run through you. I'm going to expose you and I'm going to move on. And it's rattled Neil Magny's cage. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, and obviously the Irish support for Ian here in Boston, I imagine is going to be pretty big, Mike. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Listen, they love to support the own. There's a massive Irish contingency and Brazilian, if you ask Ian Gary. He's now representing two countries. <laughs> um, look, listen, it's, it's great. I mean, if you look at Conor McGregor, I forget who it was. It wasn't Diego Brandao, but he had a fight in uh, Boston anyway, regardless ago, when he yeah. first started. And 10 years ago, and that was very, very calculated by Dana White. And we could see a similar thing here. Mm -hmm. Problem is, he's going to go out there and back it up now. Talk is cheap. Talk is easy. Fighting the veterans, people like Neil Magnet. Now, listen, you look at his record, you see a few losses sprinkled in there, but I'm just looking at it here. It's only to the very best. Gilbert Burns, top of the food chain. Shavkat Rachmanov, we know how good he is. So on and so forth. Michael Chiesa, Happy Old Dos Anjos former champion. So yes, there's losses. Yes, he's the gatekeeper to, you know, potential bigger, bigger things, title fights, eliminated, well, all these kind of things. Go. But to beat him, 
You've got to be really good. 135, the official weight for Sean O'Malley. 135, championship weight. You know, you did say, Nick, you saw a tweet that he was on weight earlier, so it doesn't surprise us that he's first onto the scale. What do we make of the hair this week? It's always different. Listen, he's plugged into uh, this generation of American pop stars. When you look at the American right, music charts, scale, one all the musicians, all the rappers, they all look like they've all got tattoo faces, they've all got rainbow colored hair. He's just Magnum plugged into this generation, Whaley. which is why his social media numbers are so big and he's why it's so exciting. Because if he becomes champion, he becomes a massive pay per view star, in my opinion, Sean O'Malley. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's out there looking at 6 9 the rapper. Yeah. He's got scribbles on his face. Apparently, that's cool for the kids, but you know what I mean? It's, it's not my vibe. Wait for Zhang Weili. There we go. You know, Zhang Weili, she's so great to watch. I mean, she's such a martial artist and she's such a class act. I mean, she's a monster inside well, the octagon. But when you on a day to day, she is a sweetheart. Was built the reigning defending undisputed UFC Bantamweight champion, the funk master, Al Jermain Sterling. There we go. We're seeing this a lot now, aren't we? The champions and the top contenders, first on the scales, every event, consistency. This is what we like to see, professionalism. Well, listen, that's exactly what Al Jermaine Sterling is. He's a professional. Hold on, let's have a listen. The official weight for the champ, of course. Al Jermaine Sterling. Yeah. And with that, your you Never, ever in doubt, as you say, Nick. Official. An absolute true professional and and the results are there you know this is a tough fight for sean o'malley and certainly other than peoria Yan, it's a stark step up in terms of competition right, achievements in terms of what his opponent can bring to the table division, marina and here is amanda lemos is it amanda lemos nope. no marina marie Moreau. no <laughs> yeah <laughs> She fights Kareen Silver. That's on the early prelims. Yeah, the Iron Lady herself. One twenty-five. She actually has a win. For Marina One twenty-five championship weight as well. She actually has a win over Kareen Silver from ten years ago. So they're wow. running it back again here. Yeah, she was in good form until she ran in. into Jessica Mai, yeah. Spider to the scale competing in a Bantamweight. Yeah, yeah, listen, Marina Morales, she's got beautiful boxing, very well-rounded. Cody the Renegade Gibson. And they're coming out thick and fast here. I like it. Here we go. This is mm -hmm. the ultimate fighter finale. He takes on Brad Katona. Both veterans, both looking for their second stint in the UFC, or making their second stint appearance in the UFC. This guy had such for Cody bang Gibson. on. I, I feel for Cody Gibson. He had such a hard time on his first stint in the UFC. You know, he had four fights. He lost three of them. His debut was against right, Aljamain Sterling. He was in the main event. Main then he had the win against Johnny Legend Bedford. Then he lost against Gamborian and uh, Silva DeAndre. All top contenders. So Here we go, Pedro Munoz. In for Sayudo, obviously, against Chito Vera. The official weight for Pedro Munoz. Nice. It's a proper fight, that Mike. Phantom weight's looking to make a statement. <sighs> That's a really good fight, Nick. I mean, Pedro Munoz doesn't get the attention that he deserves. Right, if we saw what he did Pedro against Pedro O'Malley that first round, probably division, won that. The then he beats. Mario Bautista. Yeah. Mario hmm. Bautista. Uh, we're just going back to. Um, who we were talking about there. <laughs> Just remind me, who was it? Oh, uh, 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 Pedro, Pedro Munoz. Munoz. He beat Chris Pedro Gutierrez <laughs> last time. But Pedro Munoz is very, Four very good. He's got heavy, six. heavy hands. And again, the only people Mario to beat it. Bautista. We're talking the mm -hmm. likes of Dominic Cruz, Jose Aldo, Frankie Edgar. Again, top right, of the food chain so he doesn't have the same US recognition of a henry cejudo but he's Silva. just as dangerous if you ask me not with the wrestling but in terms of the power in the hands the experience and just what he brings to the table yeah they're coming in thick and fast here natalia this is natalia silva. natalia silva yeah this girl can fight she's from paulo costa's team based out of brazil she's in nine and oh form right now three wins in the ufc the got an amazing bonus last football. year if you remember that spin and back kick got a performance of the night bonus she can fight man 
opportunity to be ranked here as well as she takes on Andrea mm -hmm. Lee. All right, next fighter to the scale competing in a prelim on ESPN in the UFC's middleweight division, RoboCop Gregory <laughs> Rodriguez. Love this guy. I mean, as you said, Nick, he's always, I mean, he goes out there and he just uses the hands a lot of the time. But when he was on the contender series, that's what he did there as well. But this man, the, the jujitsu on him, the grappling ability that he has is unbelievable. I think he's one of those guys. Gregory Rodriguez. He's fallen in love with the hands, you know, and because uh, I've seen him go out there and stand toe to toe. I've called many of his fights at the apex. Very, very exciting. But sometimes well, I just think, scale, shoot to take down. What are you <laughs> doing? You know, but we love to see it. Absolutely. Training partner of Jackery, I think he was. Black belt from the same gym. Yep, that's right. Um, and here he is, Brad Katona. Brad Katona here. His second shot. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. So Trains to SBG, good grappling. Sorry, Caroline. Mm -hmm. I was going to say he will make history if he wins, yep. having Five, to have won two Brad ultimate Katana. fighters. It's never been done before. Of course, he takes on Cody Gibson, who we just saw weigh in. Yeah, yeah, and obviously him. he had a good showing on the Ultimate Fighter. That's why he's here in the final. Had some tough matchups in the UFC. Lost to Hunter Azure and Marab right, Davalishvili. We all know how good Marab is. Left the organization, five, rebounded, four-fight win streak in Brave FC, and now Saturday he's in the night, final. So, Amanda yeah. Lemos. Here she is. As you That's say, Nick, 36 story, years old. Man. She knows, as you say, this is probably the last shot at something like this. You know, I mean, she goes out there, beat Zhang Wei Li. I mean, that's it. She's done it. Top of the food chain becomes the champion. That can bring a lot of pressure, though, as well. You know what I mean? Because you might think, oh, this really is it. I'm 36. If I don't get this done, I'm never going to get a title fight again. But that can bring out the best of you as well. Mm -hmm. 14, the official weight for oh, Amanda Lemos. And with that, your UFC strawweight title fight is now official i was saying she's she has a really interesting story she actually sort of gave up fighting and became a, a motorcycle taxi driver and um it was only when right, she sort of got a last minute call scale. up from the ufc that she First came back to it so what a story if she's to be victorious tomorrow night Chito Vera. and what a story this will be because if Chito yeah. Vera beats pedro munoz if Sean O'Malley beats Aljamain Sterling, lots of ifs. Uh, but if he does, <laughs> then O'Malley's already saying that this will be the man. Because, of course, he's the only person to defeat Sean O'Malley. And, and you want to do that. You want to avenge those losses. Now, some people don't like it. Look at Cheeto. <laughs> He's waiting. He's milking the moment. He's a blooming superstar. Um, Corey Sandhagen, I saw a video yesterday. He's well, vexed about that. He's like, that's some weak sauce. The hey, the reality is, is Petrusky. Corey Sandhagen's injured right now, so it sucks for him. But here we go. Andre Petrovsky. He's been calling out Bo Nickel amongst all others. Records that Bo Nickel's been turning him down in two grappling matches. Six for Andre Petrovsky. He's in great shape. He's, well, he he no <laughs> he's a, he's a go, legit Gracie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The guy's <laughs> a legit Gracie family uh, jiu jitsu black belt. That's why. The guy's got a lot of confidence. He grapples outside of his MMA fights as well. So I, mean, I like that matchup. Why not? Call him out. Go for it. Dennis Tillulin. 185, the official weight for Dennis Tululin. As you say, Mike, the guy's got, Tululin's got loads of knockouts on his record, but is, is, all his defeats, I think, have right, come by submission. The so there's a route to victory for Robocop. But as we know, Robocop will stand and bang with him. So they'll just deliver a war. And Brad Tavares. Brad Tavares. He's been around for a long time. You know, let's remember, he went to a decision with Israel Adesanya, gave a good account of himself. Granted, it was an earlier version of Izzy. I think Izzy has improved leaps and bounds. But still, Brad great knockout power, lots of experience, but a tough fight against Chris Weidman. Yeah. It's a good matchup, Mike. They're both veterans. You know, they're both losing more than they're winning recently. It's a good, uh, it's a good kind of crossroads fight for both fighters. Andrew KGB, always enjoy watching her fight. 
Excellent striker, and always on display. Tons of experience for most of the big names in the division as well. So, yeah, Andrew KJB, always fun to watch. It's a good fight, that. Ripped good as test always. for Natalia Silva. Yeah, Natalia Silva, as I say, is a great prospect. Right, but Angela Lee only loses, loses to top banked opponents. She only loses to the top 10. GM3 Mershaw. And here's the opponent of Andre Petrovsky. And listen, Petrovsky, as I say, he's calling out Bo Nickel. You got to worry about this guy first. Gerald Mirchar is very underrated. You know, he's got excellent jujitsu, so he can counter the style Gerald of his opponent. I think he's actually and, said he uh, wants. Mm -hmm. Go on. Sorry, Mike. No, I was going to say he said he wants to call out Paul Craig if he gets a win here. So um, that'd be interesting. Mm. That would be interesting. Well, yeah, because he's got the jujitsu to match him. That's for sure. He's got a tremendous amount of experience. I think it's over 50 professional mix, 51 yeah. professional fights. 51. I mean, he's been there, done it, got the t-shirt and the gray hairs to go with it. I'm sure. He got knocked out by Joe Pfeiffer back in April. Uh, which ended a little bit of a winning form for him. Because if you remember, a lot of fans who dip into UFC will probably remember Mershaw for obviously getting knocked out by Hamza Chemaev a couple of years ago. But he's been in really good form since, not lost too many. He did lose to Joe Pfeiffer. He got knocked out back in April. And a month later, he challenged Joe Pfeiffer to a grappling match and then lost that as well <laughs> in his own kind of wheelhouse. So... <laughs> You could do with putting Joe Pfeiffer <laughs> in the rear view mirror, Mr. Mearshall, you know, moving on from it. Why not? <laughs> As you say, Nick, well, it is a shame out. because he's he's known for that fight against Hamzat Chimeyev, but he did rebound with three wins in a row, all submissions as well. So he's definitely a capable fighter. This delays killing us, Caroline. I apologize. I'm stepping over. I'm you. sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, it is. There's quite a delay. I was going to say they've come out thick and fast. Um, but I will use this opportunity to say to everyone watching at home, if you want to send your questions in for any of us, use the hashtag fight week on Twitter, ask your question and we'll be sure to sprinkle them in throughout the show when we get another little lull in the action. But as there is a bit of a break now, I've got a quiz for you boys. Are you up for it? You up for a couple of questions? A quiz? <laughs> I mean, you... I've had three, three hours sleep, you know, but let's go. Yeah, this there is we go. in Nick Pete's favor. You know, I, I guess I can Finally, win everything. Can I, I might win know? one. <laughs> well, look, as we are in Boston, in celebration of all things Irish this weekend. So this uh, this question comes at you from Gary, our producer. Name as many Irish fighters as you can, Northern Ireland and right, Republic of Ireland included, that have fought at least on once ESPN in the UFC. Hold that thought the until the, we see what goes on here. Time to think about it. I'm holding. <sighs> Okay, your other ultimate fighter, Finale. This is in the lightweight division. Kurt Holobile taking on Austin Hubbard. This will be his third stint in the UFC. Look at that for third time lucky coming back for opportunities. Third stint. He's, four, he's 0 for 4 as well in UFC terms. He did win uh, on Dana White's Contender Series. And a half, the official weight for Kurt Holobo. He'll be thinking the Octagon's cursed because he's had four fights in the full UFC, lost them all. He had one fight in Dana White's Contender Series, won by knockout, then got, a, got changed to a no contest because he used an illegal IV drip. So for him... He needs this win more than anything else. Otherwise, forget about it for the rest of it. You're just cursed in the octagon, son. He needs it. What was the question again, Caroline? How many can we name? <laughs> oh, back to our quiz. <laughs> How many Irish, Republic of Ireland and Northern Irish <clears throat> fighters who have competed in the UFC? I've got to write them, write them, them down so I can record the results. I can name them all. I mean, I mean them, Mike. How, how, should we, how are should we, we do this? Piece, if, you, if you go first, Mike, I'll all go right, second right. and we we'll alternate. Okay, go on. All Mike right, first, okay, off you go. Okay. Ian Gary. Are oh, you easy? Yeah. To, talk about low hanging fruits. <laughs> Jeez. Hey, hey, is he Irish? Is <laughs> he competing this one. weekend? The I'll answer start at the beginning. Is yes, my I'll, start, I'll start at the beginning. Tom Egan. Ooh. Tom Egan. Uh, Back to you, Mike. Norman Park. Norman Ooh. Park. Northern mm. Ireland. Can we have Northern Ireland? Okay. All right. Fair enough. Yeah, Northern Ireland included, uh, yeah. 
yeah. Charlie Ward. Why are you both missing the, the most obvious glorious Conor <laughs> McGregor? <laughs> That's the one. Uh, Aisling Daly. Ooh, yep. The first man to hang Conor McGregor his professional defeat, Joseph Duffy. Joe Duffy. Mm. Uh, uh, Cathar Kath Pendred. Cathar Pendred? Here's a throwback for you. Stevie Lynch. Yes. The Stevie smiling Lynch. assassin. <laughs> uh, who, These are brilliant. Who did we see the other week? Oh, Paddy Hollahan. I'll go with Paddy first and then I'll have his fighter next. Yeah. Um, What was he called? Fought in Abu Dhabi. Reese McKee. Reese uh -huh. McKee. Yeah, he's back. He's back, isn't he? He's, yeah. good, good he's back. Yeah, he's got a fight coming up soon, I think. And that better just party. Gary to come out with this one. You know what I mean? <laughs> let's name every fighter, Irish fighter in the UFC. Let's let, let, let's name fighters. We can do the American fighters England, next please. if you want. <laughs> <laughs> we might let's be there in a while. Uh, 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 Shauna Bannon. Yeah, Paddy, Paddy Shauna Bannon. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, Shauna Ooh, Bannon. at the moment. Mm. There's only three left. Oh, God. Neil Seawe. Oh, that was the one I could think of. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yep. Nicholas, over to you, sir. Mm -hmm. How many have we got? 12? 10? Got Listen, it doesn't matter how many uh, we've got. Five, the reality ten, is, can you name you've one? Got can, you na more. can you name one? It doesn't matter. Go, come on. There is a countdown. Uh, this is live TV. We can't go on. A... All right. Doom, doom, if you shut up, I'll name one. Doom, 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 <laughs> I was going to say, am I mentally giving you a time? Doom, 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 can, I, can I have Carl Lachlan? Doom, doom, the Don. Bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 no. bum. Yeah. He's pretty signed. Sorry, Nick. That is an incorrect so answer. You are excluded from the tournament. You, you so know, I'm sorry. It is what it is. Did we get six each? No, you lost. You defined the rules as yet, let's boys. go first. It's yet. a knockout phase. Well, I won. <laughs> We've finished. Oh, wait, there's a couple <laughs> of Here's one, Mike. More. Here's one for Mike. Paul Felder. <laughs> <laughs> The Irish Dragon. Hey, he will not take Marcus kindly Davis. to that. Marcus Davis. Marcus Davis. The Irish Hand Grenade. Oh, Marcus Davis, there's the two. Irish Hand Grenade. Um, <laughs> Paul Felder well, got in my face once because I, I was ripping him for not really being Irish. He does not like that. You know, I'm like, does anyone <laughs> in your family have an Irish accent? I'm like, because my mum is like Irish, like legit Irish. <laughs> I don't claim to be Irish. He did not like that, but love you, Paul. Hope you well, well brother. Sean O'Malley, Sean O'Malley actually came out and said, I think he's about, he said 60 something percent Irish. So that was a good statement to make ahead of, ahead of this weekend, add to his popularity. What does passport say? I mean, That's all I need to know. What does passport say? Come on. As I said, does anyone, okay, he lives so... in Arizona. You're American yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. Be proud to be American. Everyone says, I'm English. I, I, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. The, the, you're American, bro. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, Paul so Redmond. Mike, you won that Paul one. Redmond. Round Paul Redmond. One. Oh. Paul Redmond. Is whoa, he on whoa, whoa. my list? Nick, the, the yes, tournament yes. is over. You evened the score. You evened the score. No, okay, it isn't. Is oh, what are you talking about, no, Caroline? We, we... All right, so I'll tell you what, I'll even the score in two weeks. Do you know what I mean? We have to have a cutoff <laughs> point at some time. You can't just bounce back in. The conversation's moved on. Do you know what I mean? There's one you just haven't said. Talk, well, just, just take it like a man. You haven't said. <laughs> Come on, who can get the final one? It does, it, we'll leave you to I've think about out. it. We'll leave you I'm to think about on. it. Even We've Stephen. got a way show to focus that, on. on. We've lost. It's not even that's Stevens. What are you talking about? <laughs> We'll I call knew that Mike one a draw. Would be competitive. Okay, we'll call that one a draw. There's more questions to come. You've got a chance to, to steam ahead. All right. <laughs> okay. Let me ask you a question, oh, yeah. gentlemen. So regarding Aljamain Sterling, he obviously has made weight. We've got our uh, championship fight. But one thing Sean O'Malley's kind of counting on is 
he says when it's such a difficult weight cut because it's no you know no secret Aljo has a hard weight cut that it leaves the chin a bit vulnerable and obviously with Sean being very good at finding the chin that's something he's potentially counting on what are your thoughts on that well well it does hard weight cuts affect your ability to take a shot but I'm just looking here Aljamain Sterling's a professional. He fought a made weight just in May. What are we in now? August. You know what I mean? May, May, June, July. Three months. Three months. <laughs> it's not like he's been on the sidelines for two years. It's not like he's piled on loads of weight. The man's a professional. He competes regularly. Uh, and yeah, look, listen, it affects the, the ability to take a shot. However, I don't really think that's going to be a factor this weekend. No, fair enough. No. He's only been knocked out once in his entire career, and that was that very early on knee. If you remember from Marlon Marais, I think it was like in the inside the first 30 seconds or 60 seconds. So, listen, he's been in there with big hitters. He's been in there with, with heavy strikers before. He's taken big shots. He's rode big shots. I, I don't think there's a, there's a big fear there necessarily, even though he has outgrown the weight division. I think more than anything else, it's because he's been so dominant in the weight division. And his best mate, Mirab, is ready to step in and is waiting patiently in the wings to please let me have an opportunity. I think that's part of the reason why Aljo is so committed to moving up to featherweight. One, to add to his legacy. Two, to leave the door open for his mate. But also, I think because what more is there to do? We're already talking about him being one of the best bantamweights of all time. Now he wants to win a belt of featherweight, so we're talking about him being one of the best of all time, period. Otherwise, I think if there was still work to be done, I think if there was wins and losses on that championship reign, then I think he'd probably stay down at this weight division. That was actually going to be and my question. He it. doesn't win. Yeah. Let's go ahead, Yeah, yeah. Mike. I, I mean, he's done everything he needs to. Henry Cejudo, TJ Dillashaw, Piotr, Jan Corey, Sandig, Pedro Munoz. He's beaten everyone up, most of the top contenders. And there's a massive opportunity at 145 against Alexander Volkanovsky. That's going to be a big, big money fight. And again, listen, he, people were booing him like crazy. <laughs> it's He's so misunderstood. Listen, he's living up to it. They're all booing him. So he's like, I'm going to give you something to boo for. But that's a very honorable thing to open the door for his teammate, Marab. That's probably why he's moving up. Granted, he is a big bantamweight. But I think that's a really nice and honorable gesture from the champ. No, it really is. But so if he is to move up, he he gets his hand raised, he moves up, he faces Volk. He goes for that double champ status. Alexander Volkanovsky is a whole different animal. He's even fought up at lightweight. You know, what was he as a rugby player, even heavier? How do you think Aljamain matches up to, to, to Volkanovsky? Yeah, I mean, listen, Volkanovski is a tough fight for anybody. He's the pound for pound number one on the planet. Went up there, had a razor close fight with a lightweight champ. So on paper, early odds, you've got to lean towards the champ Volkanovski. Of course you do. But this is mixed martial arts and anything can happen. And last time out against Henry Cejudo, a lot of people probably had Cejudo winning that fight quite handily. He shocked the world. He won the fight. He took him down. So... You get, there's no guarantees in mixed martial arts. I think he would compete. I think he would give a good account of himself, but I don't see him beating Volkanovski. Fair enough. If he loses this fight, say Sugar, Sugar Sean does win, do you think he still goes up, Nick, or do you think there'd be unfinished business for him and, and would potentially see a rematch or, or something else? Um. <clears throat> I'm honestly not sure. I think there's some, you know, I think it just depends how other fights in this weight division play out. I think the, the Cheeto Vera rematch makes so much sense. And especially, listen, I, I believe Sean O'Malley's got one route to victory here. I don't believe he beats Aljamain Sterling on points over 25 minutes. I think he's more than capable of knocking Aljamain Sterling out, even though Aljo, as we've just talked about, has got an incredible chin. I think it's the shots you don't see that really sting you and really put you out. And I think Sean O'Malley and as an orthodox striker and has absolutely got that in his locker. If he were to do that, if he was to win the belt, in my opinion, by knockout, I think it would be decisive. And I think the pressure on the UFC to, again, open the floodgates with Sean O'Malley because he is a, a, a generational athlete. He is basically a pop star 
in UFC. And he's also a fighter that's mixed martial arts from day one. You know, these 26, 27, 28 year olds, they didn't start in wrestling like say Aljo did or even in jujitsu or whatever. He started by training mixed martial arts. This is the generation that's coming through now. And absolutely, Sean O'Malley is the poster boy of that. And I think there's so many big fights because everybody's fresh meat then in the weight division. So there's so many opportunities to make big fights that aren't rematches that the UFC mm -hmm. can sell again. And all and Sean O'Malley, front and center of this weight division, just makes so much sense in terms of generating pay-per-view dollars. Yeah, let's let's go back to the fight card for a second. So I want to pull up another bantamweight fight. We saw Mario Bautista um, weigh in. He gets a new opponent in Damon Blackshear. He replaces Cody Garbrandt. Now Blackshear is stepping in literally on a well, what a few days, a week's week. notice. He fought one week ago. <laughs> literally fought a week ago. Was having some sushi with his coach um, and his manager, and and said, "Hey, I I quite fancy that fight. I'll hop back in." in a week's time what do you think well we haven't actually seen him weigh in yet so let's hope he he can do so but what do you think of that mike <laughs> yeah yeah well, that's probably why that. we haven't <laughs> yeah that's why we haven't seen him weigh in yet because obviously since the fight last week he's been enjoying himself and probably taking on a lot of sodium a lot of carbs so it makes it a nightmare however he did just step in there he got the job done in the first round pulled off a twister got a bonus i think one of only three twisters in ufc history so he, he took no damage he's good to go and this is what you want to do this is the kind of attitude we want to see but mario batista had a full training camp with, with a different opponent in mind to be fair i don't think cardio is going to be an issue for either man but it's a nice little addition i mean pulling off a twister like that that's that's going to get attention and that's what's got him this fight in the first place so fair play to him and i wish him the best of luck this weekend yeah nick and mario bautista right you can imagine he'd be a little bit disappointed you're about to face the former champion you know a name such as cody gobrand and you know no disrespect to to demand but suddenly you get somebody that doesn't quite have the same caliber of name if you like you know what i'm sure he's happy that the fight was saved but there's probably got to be a little bit of disappointment in there yeah listen of, of course you know because because Cody Garbrandt represents kind of like a bit of a lottery ticket opponent for anybody around this weight division because of he's the former champion, but he really is struggling to, you know, put two or three wins together. So for that opportunity, yes. But more than anything else, it's the fact that you've gone from Cody Garbrandt, who will come, dig his toes in, stand and bang, swing away. Real danger there from the power shots. We know he's a knockout merchant, but that's where the threat is on the feet. And now with five days notice, you're being handed a guy, Blackshear, who's now your, rather than being the predator chasing the prey, it's kind of a reverse. Now he's chasing you. He's coming off a twist of submission, a bonus in the bank. He's got, you know, nine submissions in his, in his 11 career wins. You've gone from a heavy, heavy striker to very much a heavy grappler, which is what Bautista is himself as well. So listen, this is the this is professional fighting. He'll be happy the fight's still going on. But everything he did in camp that was focused on a game plan, pick that up, throw it out the window. That's no longer relevant. Let's go back to what we know. It's going to be a grappling heavy fight. All right. And um, just moving on to, oh, actually, no, before I move on, just one question to you, Mike, on that. Making weight twice within a week. You know, we don't. Have you done that before? Yeah, How yeah, hard yeah. is that? Can you imagine? I've I've done it within two weeks. I haven't done it within a week. Um, listen, you know, how much weight can you put on in a week? It's not too much, you know. So it's just manipulating the water. Uh, the carbohydrates play a real factor. You've got to flush those out. But as soon as he found out, he might have been eating sushi. He would have put the soy sauce down right then and there. No salt. <laughs> avoid the carbs. Get on the treadmill. Get in the sauna. Have a miserable week. Be starving the whole time. Get on the scale. And off you pop. Listen, it's what he signed up for. It's what he's getting paid for. And 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 we know that. So the the sacrifices we make in terms of cutting weight during the week, it's they don't care. They, they, they don't bother because they relish these kind of opportunities. And as you said before, Dana loves that. He loves to see fighters willing to step up, willing to step in on short notice, save the day and all the rest of it. So he's already won in many ways. And to your point, Batista, you know, listen, he's got a very, very different opponent now. So it's going to be a fun one though, because Batista, 
I think his last three wins were by submission as well. So he's no stranger to the ground. But as you mentioned, Nick, you're absolutely right. Cody Garbrandt's going to come, keep the fight on the feet, look to use the hands. Very different approach now. Mm-hmm. Well, let's hope uh, Cody Garbrandt gets healed up quickly. He's suffered a lot of injuries in his career. But let's pull up the card one more time for our other bantamweight fight on that main card. Of course, Marlon Vera ranked number six against Pedro Munoz, number 10. And um, we've already talked about the fact that Tita Vera will possibly, with a win here, get the next title shot. That's what Sean O'Malley wants if he wins. But Pedro Munoz is, is no easy task. The young punisher will certainly bring it to him, Mike. Yeah, look, listen, it's a tough fight because uh, Chiro Vera traditionally is a slow starter and that's in five round fights. So this is a big thing for him. He's got to start quick. You know, it's all well and good making reads, being tentative, downloading data, whatever you want to call it. But with three rounds, you can't afford to lose one straight away because you're taking your time. So I think he will have done, done a lot of work in training camp. But look at what he's capable of, knocking out Dominic Cruz, even against Rob Font, sensational fight. But it took him a couple of rounds to get into the fight. So I think he's going to go at Pedro Munoz right from the get-go because he's well aware of the word on the street. He's well aware of the talk and people saying he's a slow starter. But be careful what you do because Pedro Munoz has got massive power. And as I said before, the only people to beat him are top of the food chain, former champions and legends in the game. Pedro Munoz never been finished and he's got unfinished business with Sean O'Malley as well, hasn't he, Nick? Yeah, as you say, there's a real narrative there for Cheeto, but there's a real narrative there for, for Munoz as well. You know, both these guys, whoever wins, will be praying that O'Malley becomes the new champion in the main event because they've both got narratives to sell, as Mike pointed out at the top of the show. You know, in his last fight, Pedro Munoz um, had a, had a, was, was looking great against Sean O'Malley. And then the eye poke, you know, ended the fight. And prior to that, he, he was probably a round up. So, listen, he bounced back start of the year. He's had a win against Gutierrez, uh, which obviously puts him back in the win column. He's jumped at this opportunity when it's come its way, when Sayudo's pulled out, knowing full well that, listen, the winner of this fight gets the new champion if the new champion is crowned. And you know what? If the old champion tames the belt, then... He's going to walk away from the belt anyway. So who's going to fight Mirab? One of these guys could get could be the next title contender, regardless of who wins in the main event. Well, this fight definitely screams fun. But with Stan Hagen injured, um, Mirab mm-hmm. sort of coming back from his surgery as well, it is, it is quite wide open. So this is a really important night in the bantamweight division, Mike. <laughs> Absolutely, it is. Anytime the title is on the line, you know, it brings up the intensity. That's why this is the main event. And Aljamain Sterling, for all the boos that he gets, I think people love to hate him now. So it's just, I think if they met him, if they sat down with him, they spoke with him, Aljamain's a great guy. He's a class act and he works hard. The proof is in the pudding. But as I say, he's kind of become like this pantomime villain now. And of course, Sean O'Malley is extremely popular. As Nick said, he's crossing over with the youth of uh, the world these days. He's got the tattoos. He's got the, the SpongeBob haircut that's, that's got every color of hair imaginable, every color of in there. He, he looks like a rapper and people love him for that but he's a great fighter right the hands are amazing but he's got to stop the takedowns that is the big thing here but yeah whoever wins this one you know Aljamain Sterling's on about moving up regardless Sean O'Malley if he loses this he'll be very disappointed but Pedro Munoz Marlon Vera the two stables of the bantamweight division whoever wins this fight puts him right in pole mm-hmm. position because of course Sandhagen currently is out of action Yeah, this one screams that it's going to be a fun fight. And going back to Sean O'Malley, for all the flashy cars and the hair and the sunglasses, he's also bought a farm and he's dealing with cows and chickens at the moment as well. He said it's his place of peace. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, I want to move us on to the prelims. Let's take a look at the card for that. Heading up the prelims, Chris Weidman, the former champion returning. Um, Sorry, that's the the main... (coughs) 
We lost Caroline. We, we got a little freeze. We, we got a little freeze in action there. I think the the Wi-Fi in Boston has gone down for a minute there. We'll just talk amongst ourselves. I will be the host. Nick Pete, great for you to join us here. We are coming live from the Boston UFC 292 Wayne Show. Um, I think she was just going to talk about Chris Weidman there coming into this one against Brad Tavares. If you've seen the talk this week, Chris Weidman is feeling quite disrespected because he's on the prelims. And listen, I get it, but. The the reality is he's struggled with the form lately. He's been out for two years as well. But this is a big opportunity. Go out there, beat Brad Tavares, remind the world what you're capable of. And I think we'll see him on the main card next time for sure. And Caroline Pierce is back. Sorry we, about that. We haven't seen you, you actually we haven't seen Chris. If you remember, we haven't seen Chris for two and a bit years now. And even prior to that time, listen, he's the former champion, of course. I was blessed to be there the night he beat, well, on both occasions when he beat Anderson Silva. But we haven't seen him for over two years. Prior to that, he was in two and six form. That final loss in that six-fight losing run was, of course, the broken leg. How, you know, how, how the world kind of comes around in circles. He broke his leg, of course. Um, so we he needs to rehabilitate himself as a legit fighter. Again, I think it's a great opponent with Brad Tavares. My issue here with Chris Weidman, I understand what he's saying. And and after Cody Garbrandt dropped off, I thought, that's it now. Bautista and Black Shea will drop off and they will promote Weidman uh, and Tavares to this main card. And I'm surprised UFC haven't done that. But you've also got to remember that in the US, Mike, as you well know, it's over $100 for the pay-per-view portion of the cards. The rest of the card is on ESPN. And to have Chris Weidman, the former champion, taking on a veteran like Brad Tavares in that main event with all the narratives at stake, with both guys desperate for a win, that's how you sell the pay-per-view portion. Because we know Weidman versus Tavares is going to deliver something. Something special is going to happen. And that will, you know, in, in the eyes of the, the UFC, Get, get people to buy the pay-per-view. So I understand why he's there, but it does feel a little bit wrong, as I say, when a, a major fight or a major fighter has fallen off the main card. Yeah, you can understand why. The reality why is, though... He... Go, Am I back, yeah, guys? Yeah, I no, no, you, you, I'm back. Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, no, no, I was going to say, I... Oh, oh, what? <laughs> I dropped 100%, off for a moment. Karen, you are um... back. I am back. <laughs> but um, no, you, you did say, Mike, at the beginning, what I was what I was alluding to before I disappeared um, about him feeling disrespected. But yeah, Nick, you're right. Basically, more eyes on you when you headline that prelim. You drive the, the views into the main card. But you can understand how he might feel. What I wanted to ask you, Mike, is he's not just here to say, I broke my leg. I've come back. I can still fight. Great. Tick that box. I'm done. He still wants to make a run at the title. He said it's really just to prove it to himself. Do you feel Chris Weidman still has, you know, in your division, you know this division, do you still feel he has it in him to make that run towards and, and be the champion once again? Well, the last time he was the champion of the world was 2015. We're now in 2023. That's eight years ago. And I think a key thing to point out is that he's 39 years old and he's only won two out of his last day. So I think that's part of the reason as well. Of course, he's been away for two years. The leg break was really bad. If you remember, he was talking about it this week. The bone was sticking out of the leg. It wasn't just a break. I mean, there were some real issues there. Had surgery, then he got reinfected. He had to have surgery again. Uh, but he's very happy. He said the leg's fine. He's going to come right, out there. The gentlemen, first thing he's going to do is throw a leg kick as hard time, as he can. More than two Hold on. Years, the former oh, perfect time. And here wow, he is. I mean, come on. Talk about that. Here he is walking onto the scale. I mean, Chris, Chris Wyman was the man. He was taking out all the Brazilians. Anderson Silva, Leoto Machida, a used teabag version of Vito Belfort. The official weight for Chris Wyman. 186. Uh, but, but you know, so, he is so skilled and so good. Anthony yeah. Smith, I was talking to him on my podcast this week. He was saying when he used to train with Chris Wyman, he couldn't win in any department. He couldn't win on the feet. He couldn't win in the jujitsu, in, uh, in the wrestling department. He said he was that good, you know. But the losses... You know, he got knocked out or finished four times in a row. Granted, Rocco, Romero, Gegard Mousasi, all great fighters. But when you start to get finished in quick succession, so well and good to have the physicality, this thing starts to let you down there. So there's a big mental barrier for Chris Wyman this weekend. Not only the leg break, but the losses. Six out of eight hasn't gone his way. 
And I think I think he's going to be nervous come Saturday night. Is there? Is I know there I'm going to be nervous. Like, <laughs> I was going to say I'm going to I'm going to be nervous. Yeah, I think we all are because Chris Weidman's, you know, every UFC fan, you know, we can all think back to that decade ago when he shocked the world, when he beat Anderson Silva, when he finally, you know, wrestled that middleweight title belt away from him. And there was a changing of the guard in the sport in that middleweight division. I think he will always have an affinity with fans because of that moment. But that was a long time ago. And the sport moves so fast. And the, the, the sport evolves so fast as well. And that's my fear. A decade ago, this was the best middleweight on the planet. But this is 10 years later in a sport that's only 30 years old. And the sport has changed so much. And I'm, I, I believe he's more than capable of beating Brad Tavares. Is he capable of getting back into the top 10 of this middleweight division? Is he capable of fighting to a position where he takes on Israel Adesanya? I don't know. I don't, I'm not at this stage of his life. I don't know. But listen, I'm going to enjoy the journey, as you say, Caroline. This is a fight that I've been watching on Saturday night, hiding behind the pillow, just hoping nothing breaks and both these guys get to deliver something a bit special. As you yeah, say, Nick, that's what I was going to say he's about being 39. Nervous, yeah. So, so yeah. sorry, Caroline, the delay's a killer. But yeah, 39 years old. 39 years old is time to retire. 39 years old generally means you're kind of used goods. And I'm not saying that about Wyman. I'm just saying generally, right? 40 years old, pretty much. It's not when you plan a comeback. It's not when you're coming to take the title back. Generally, you, you, you're washed up, you're done, you use goods, and you, you, you're being used as a platform to promote the next generation. That's not what's happening here. Brad Tavares has been around a long time as well, and this is a fight that Chris Wyman can win. And who knows? You know, maybe he books the trend. Maybe he can show at 39 years old that I can come back. I'm still fit. I'm healthy. I'm an athlete. I've lived an athlete's lifestyle my entire life. So I'm coming back here to remind the world. And that's what he said. He's frustrated. He feels disrespected, but he's using that as motivation. And the reality is that Chris Wyman on full form, which is what he's saying he is, he's as good as they get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I certainly know that. Um, well, I don't want to see a leg kick, but I think he's uh, determined to throw one, maybe just to prove something to himself. And and in the press conference, he actually said to Brad Tavares, just let me get one in. Maybe don't check it. Don't check that that sort of first one or that second one. But um, wishing him a, a healthy fight anyway. And um, yeah, let's see. Let's see what he can do at 39 years of age. I want to, while we've got a little bit more of a lull in the action, I want to take us to another quiz question, if you're up for it, boys. Do we have a choice? Yeah, exactly. Well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I, I'll okay. do the quiz. I, I I shall partake, but we can't <laughs> if if we can't just end the quiz and then half an hour later <laughs> Nick thinks of an answer and then call it a draw. You know what I mean? That's not how quizzes go down. So Caroline, if you're willing to officiate this in a fair, okay. non-biased manner, I shall engage. But you know. I'm, I'm very strict on that. Okay, so once we say that's the end of that question, the results are as they are. This one's short, okay. And it's taking us back to the bantamweight division. Cody Gabrant is unfortunately, Gabrant is unfortunately off the card. So true or false, Dominic Cruz's first loss in the UFC came against Cody Gabrant. True or false? False. 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 Mike was in there. Yeah. Mike got that one first. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You didn't say it's, it was first at oh, the belt. True. You need I to outline these rules. Yeah, true. this is absolutely oh, no. stop, ridiculous. Stop, stop. It's true. clearly evident. No, it was true. So Cruz was undefeated true. before losing to Gabran. He <laughs> previously lost to Uriah Faber, but that was in the WEC. So you both get zero points for that one. Well, well, I said true. You didn't say we couldn't have multiple no, you answers. <laughs> you, you are, oh my word, Nicholas. You're making me question am, myself now. I, 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 I was going to say two. I was going to say two. Okay, because question, Mike went question. first. Okay. Okay. Maybe I should have like played that one a bit better with you both. Okay. Uh, it's a fair next question. Two or false? Is this the, is that what we got to do? So in, well, this one. Let me read it and then I'll, I'll let you know who can go first, okay? Or how it's how you're going to give your answers. Have a think about it for a while. <laughs> I'm 
making this up as I go along. So Nick, you mentioned that in the preview show that Randy Couture fate, uh, fought James Tony in Boston, right? Uh huh. Right, so I was we're there. Talk about, talk about Randy. You were there. Randy Couture has the record as the oldest fighter to hold a title in the UFC. How old was he when he lost the heavyweight championship to Brock Lesnar in 2008? So don't answer yet. Have you both got an answer? I want you to write it down. I do. I mean, I don't have to write it down. I'll just tell you right now, it's 46 years old, I believe. I know he was 46 when he beat Tim Sylvia, but then he got knocked out. So he might have been 47, but I will say 46. Nick or Lars, if you You're want to steal for my 46. 47, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm in that ballpark as well, yeah. I'll go, I'll, go with, I'll go with 47 then. Okay, well, Mike was closest. He was 45 years and 147 days old when he lost the heavyweight title to Brock Lesnar in 2008. Um, nice. In second place for this record is Daniel Cormier at 40 years and 150 days. So it seems like a record that would be nearly impossible to break, but you never know. So the point there goes. It's to getting Mike. a bit embarrassing for you now, Nick, isn't it? You're just losing constantly. <laughs> you know what I mean? I feel for you. Don't worry about it. It's you, fine. You'll get there. You'll get I would there. This is, I was. Go on. This is a fun one. Moving on. This is a fun one. Again, I'll, I'll sort of advise who can go first. Actually, Nick, you can go first on this one. Thanks. A former Chris Weidman opponent. Which fighter. You're going to know that all of you are going to know this straight away. Which fighter was known as the Filipino wrecking machine? Nick. Mark Munoz. Did Mike, did, Mike, did you fight Mark Munoz? Nick. <laughs> did you ever face Mark Munoz? Did that happen? Or was that leaving? I was, I was UK. No, I was supposed to fight Mark Munoz. I was matched up with him uh, at UFC on Fox 2, January 2012. It was a very quick turnaround after my Jason Mayhem Miller fight. But last minute, because Mark Munoz had to have surgery on his elbow, then I stepped up and fought Chael Sonnen on two weeks' notice, something which the greatest of all time, John Jones, refused to do. I'm not saying... Right that I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> bigger cojones than John Jones. But I mean, that's what the facts are pointed at here. Let's be honest. Brilliant. Well, did you both get that? I mean, Mike said it, Nick talked about it. You said, you point said you I was going first. For that one. I know. Wait, well, 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 what do you mean? Point? <laughs> this is ridiculous. This is, I this is why I, I don't like doing well. quizzes on this. You're as bad as Catchel <laughs> when it comes to doing quizzes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fun fact, Mark won fights at names like Damian Meyer, Chris Lieben and Tim Bosch. So he was actually, when I first started covering the UFC 10 years ago, I remember I just couldn't say his last name, I'd like Munoz, Munoz. But so Sally, our producer, would write it phonetically for me on a board every time I had to say his name, which seems, seems kind of crazy now. Anyway, moving on. What middleweight still? What year did Anderson Silva lose his middleweight championship to Chris Weidman? Nick, go on, you can go first Oof. this time because I keep giving you a chance. <laughs> Thanks. I was there. I was in. I, it was at UFC International Fight Week. It would have been uh, 20, I'm just going to say 2014, 2014, 2015, International Fight Week, July. I'm going to go with 2014. Mike, do well, you have this a just shows that, yeah, this just shows because as we were saying before about Chris Wyman, been around a very, very long time. And I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, it has been a decade since he beat Anderson Silva. And I was also there for the rematch when he snapped his leg. I think it's 2013. You are correct, Mike. 2013. Well, close so. though, Nick. It was close. Yeah, no. I was there. Let me tally but, up the know, scores. Five, wasn't six, close enough. seven, eight, nine, ten, five, six, seven. Ten to Mike, seven to Nick. You are, Mike, the winner of our UFC 292 quiz. I just want to take this opportunity to, get you another trophy to, to go behind my you family, <laughs> thank my agent. Uh, I, I want to thank God, you know, for giving me the power, you know, the, the, this, this, this ridiculously fast mind that I have, you know, <laughs> i got to give a special shout out to Wikipedia that I'm looking at right now, I'm to the, my right. <laughs> Correct. 
cheated. You cheated. Okay. Of course he did. Need... Nobody said. Nobody <laughs> said. Google the answers. Oh my god! I didn't even think you'd be doing that. Okay. We're going to do the bonus question then. Just because Mike cheated, I'm going to throw out the bonus question. I'm not cheating. Oh my goodness. And this one is worth three points. (sighs) All balanced. It's okay. We've got a tweet in here from Louis Clarkson. Mike clearly cheating in the quiz. Yes, exactly. (laughs) The fans are on you. Mike's just a bloody genius. (laughs) (laughs) When his eyes wander down, he starts typing. Exactly. Okay, yeah. bonus question. This okay, I'm going to make this bonus question for four points actually. So Nick gets a chance to go ahead if he wins it. Oh yes. <laughs> All right. Name. Can we keep going ten. till I get a winner? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Name the top ten longest title reigns in UFC history. What? Anderson Silva, John Jones, Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. Do you want me to continue? You want 10? Well, hang on, you, you've gone a bit quick there. So say them again. Addison Silver. Oh. Yes. And longest Silver, as in John Jones. Most Demetrius most Johnson. Or time. George St. Pierre. I mean, I've given you yep. the big ones there. Nick, have you got anything to Nick, add? Any I mean, can add? you say anything? Hmm. And there's no uh, Google in there, guys. How many can you name? So let's Amanda see who Amanda Nunes has got to be in there. Valentina Shevchenko has got to be in there. Yeah. Uh, uh, back to the men. Chuck Liddell. Chuck's not a bad no, shout. Chuck. So, Mike, you've got three. Nick, you've got two so far. I am. I have got four or five, Caroline. I said Mighty no, Mouse, uh, Anderson, uh, Saint Pierre, Chuck Liddell. Uh, who Chuck else Liddell's not in there. Couple of us. That's three. George Saint Pierre. Yeah, yeah. George Dominic Saint Cruz. Does Dominic there. Cruz count? Dominic Cruz had it for uh, a long time, but he didn't make many defenses. He's not in there. No, no. Uh, so it's still three to two. Is it time, Caroline? Just to clarify, is it someone who's had it for a long time or made or, or made loads of defenses of it? Defenses, I would say. Because Aljamain's, Aljamain's made number record of defenses. Number of, oh, days, number of days. Number of days. Yeah. Okay. Is oh, how in there? long they held on to the belt? Nope. Uh. So it's still three Ooh. two. Ronda. All right, next fighter to weigh in. The nope. Yeah, that's It'll probably good. Saved by the bell. There's the dulcet tones of God. John Annick. Thank God. Let's no. call it a draw and move on. <laughs> we'll just call it a draw and move on. Exactly. Who we got here? No Wikipedia, meanwhile, please. There's no Wikipedia, Caroline. Straight off the top of the dome. I mean, you can't rhyme off names <laughs> that fast unless you're a genius. There we go. Kareem Silva. 125, the official weight for Kareem nice. Silva. This girl is an absolute finishing machine. She came into the UFC, first round submission, Dana White's contender series, then came in, first round Darch last summer. Then she came back, started this year, first round knee bar. She's been a sensation since she came into the UFC. Definitely one to look out for and really exciting that she's in the curtain jerk of the first fight of the night. Yeah, she's super aggressive right from the get-go. I've called a few of her fights and, uh, as you say, fun fight. And against Marina Moroz, Marina Moroz isn't backwards at going forward either. So, great way to start the night. Sorry, Caroline. No, and I was saying, as I mentioned before, this is a rematch from 10 years ago. So, this is her opportunity to get her revenge. And I wonder if we'll see... They're calling her the knee destroyer, aren't aren't they? So, um, I wonder if we'll see a little bit more of that in this fight. The knee destroyer. Jeez. Speaking to two men with bad knees. Well, I, Mike used to have bad knees. Now he's got great knees. Knee bars should I've be outlawed, man. Too. Knee bars are horrific. Oh, knee bars are terrible. Uh, yeah. The nickname's horrific. The knee destroyer. I mean, we've oh. had some bad nicknames throughout the history of the UFC. I mean, you know, the pit bull, there's about a thousand of them, you know. And there's some bad ones. But the knee destroyer, that's going to be up there. You know what I mean? It, it's, I mean, what could we call it? Give me a better version, Nick. What have you got? Uh, the knee, the knee destroyer. That's not good, is it? The knee, no, the knee no. noodler. That's not a bad one. The knee noodler. <laughs> we are in, we are in need of a better nickname. 
Well, really we've just got on. six minutes. Just six minutes now until the weigh-in window closes, and still to weigh in, Neil Magny, Ian Machado, Gareth. Oh, an hour and six minutes! <laughs> oh my god, it feels like yeah, we've been talking insane. for two hours. An hour and six yeah. minutes. Yeah, still I was going to say. Magny, I feel you pain, Ian Gary. But <laughs> <laughs> and that who else? Just two. Da, da, da. No, and um, Austin Hubbard as well for the tough finale. So three per my mm. record still to weigh in. Back to our quiz. So you've got three, Mike. You've got two, Nick. Um, do you want me to? Do you want me to give you those that you missed out, or do you want to have one yeah, final yeah. stab? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 just, just, just give us a clue. Yeah. All right. So Anderson Silva, which you said, Demetrius Johnson, number two, George Saint Pierre, number three, Amanda Nunes, number four, Jose Aldo, number five, Valentina Shevchenko, number six, John Jones, number seven. Amanda, Ugh. oh, Gary, you've put Amanda Nunes in twice. Oh, because she's, oh, okay, because she's got two John titles. Jones. Yeah, Amanda Nunes again. I got four. And then we've got Daniel Cormier and Kamara Usman. Wow. Ah, yeah. Cormier, did, Daniel Cormier, Cormier. Yeah. good shout. Yeah. yeah. Cormier so, again. yeah, Cormier overall, again. Mike, you did win. Daniel Does Cormier, Cormier 1,315 days. As, as light heavyweight champion. I assume so. Wow. Yep. Mm. I, I would Tomorrow say, not, I mean, not to, uh, not to be picking fault with the adjudicating, but DC's reigns were in two different weight classes and they were separated. So you, I think you'd have to pick one or the other. I don't feel that we could take those two reigns, add them together in terms of combined days, but still, Ian Gary, it's, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Gary Donald, <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry, brother. Gary's all <laughs> over the place. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> there we go. Just a, a, a light-hearted bit of fun. Of course, if you have any tweets, hashtag Fight Week. Send your questions in for the boys because Please. we do still have an hour left for those three fighters to weigh in. So interestingly, Neil Magny and Ian Machado Gary, number 11 and number 13, respectively, in the welterweight division, still two weigh in. So let's turn our attention back to that fight. We talked about it at the beginning. But Ian Gary, I think the social media work he's doing now. I mean, he's everywhere. He's doing all these fighter meetups during, during the fight weeks. He's an active fighter. He's, he's certainly making his star power grow and grow, but he has the tools to back it up as well. I mean, look what he, you know, undefeated and look what he's done so far in the UFC with the caliber of fighters getting better and better, Mike. Yeah, l l he's certainly doing the right thing in the octagon social media is be being very polarizing if you look at the comments which i was doing recently a lot of people enjoy it a lot of people want to see him lose the reality is he's evoking emotion out of people because that's what you want to do not everyone's going to cheer for you so just go out there be yourself but focus on the fight that's the main thing um neither man to walk on the scale let's remember they're both massive for welterweight they're both six foot three i'm sure it's not a walk in the park for either man uh but there's certainly a lot of attention on this i mean listen he said that his back is broken or something because he's the real superstar of UFC 292. I mean, he's, you know, he's trying to emulate Conor McGregor's energy a little bit there, but he got a good pop in Boston, of course, but the main event is the main event for a reason. But Ian Garrett, if he can go out there and back it up, if he can finish a Neil Magnin the way that he finished Daniel Rodriguez, listen, then a star will be born, you know, but it ain't going to be easy. Neil Magny is a tough fight, very, very experienced. But yeah, it's all well and good talking. But Ian Gary backs it up inside the octagon. So it's not just like he's a mouthpiece. He's very fast. He's very, very slick on the feet. He's not shy at saying a few things on the microphone as well. So definitely got the star power. And talking about saying some things on the microphone, Nick, I mean, I'm sure he'll have a name up his sleeve to call out after this fight. And he was even willing to step in against Wonderboy a couple of weeks ago, even in preparing for this fight, you know, when Wonderboy's fight fell off. Um, who would you like to see him fight next? I still think the Jeff Neal fight makes sense. Jeff Neal's ranked above both these guys, so even a win over Neil Magny would still see him a couple of spots below Jeff Neal. Um, and he's done a camp for Jeff Neal, so why not? You know, let's get let's get that fight on. But right now, that should be the furthest thing from his thoughts. You know, I'm sure he will have a script. He will have something he wants to say in his head when the microphone, if the microphone gets pushed into his face in the early hours of Sunday morning. But his focus has to be 100% on Neil Magny because... You know, his, his record absolutely speaks for itself. What I have been impressed with, with Ian Gary this week is, and not even, not even this week, but over the last few months, 
you know, this traveling to Brazil, going around everywhere. We know he's based out of Florida. We know he's based out of Kill Cliff, a gym where he's happy at. He's, you know, he's got some great uh, coaches there and Henry Hooft and some fantastic sparring partners, namely Shavkat amongst many others. Um, but it's the fact that he's in, not only investing himself physically in terms of his training and his views and his, you know, going over to Brazil and having, seeing different looks, but he's investing himself in terms of his social media presence as well. And that is such an important factor in modern fight sports. You know, look at, look at um, uh, the Paul brothers, you know, the, 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 you're boxing in uproar because no, Jake Paul's taking no, millions of dollars. No, no, no. no. Jake Paul's taking what, millions what of dollars doing? out of boxing. People are saying what because are he's doing? this social media presence. And that's what I keep saying to professional fighters is don't be jealous of what he's doing because that's his audience. You've got to create your own audience. You've got to invest in your social media. You've got to make yourself a social media personality and a fighter. And that's what Ian Gary's doing. In fact, he's, he's took one of the team members that work with us here at TNT that did some stuff with us. He's now traveling the world with Ian Gary, document, video documenting his every move. They're putting it on socials. He's got all kinds of channels going. I like that in modern fight sports, that is an essential part of cashing in, of generating the millions of dollars. You've got to do that. You've got to get that audience engaged with you. And I think the UFC realized that he's invested in that side of it and they're giving him the opportunities to back that up as well. And I think you're right. Whether you love him or hate him, people are talking about him. And that's what the UFC oh. like. That's what's getting the eyes on him. But in turn, in changing the opponent, I mean, first of all, we've got Neil Magny still to weigh in, as I said. So last minute, he was actually, um, I think he was training with one of the, um, or helping prepare one of the tough finale um, uh, contestants as well. So he was already training and going to be here as a cornerman. Um, but now he's got to weigh in as well, last minute. What sort of a matchup is this for Neil Magny? Because he's been protecting his position as kind of the gatekeeper, if you like, to the division. But then you get this young, hungry upcomer that wants to sort of move move ahead of you. And um, there must be a certain mindset there, Mike, around the fact, well, I'm more experienced. I'm the veteran. I'm not going to let this young kid come in and um, take what I've worked hard for, so to speak. Yeah, in terms of matchup for Neil Magnet, obviously he's not as dynamic on the feet. He's not the striker that Ian Gary is. He's very capable, but he has struggled with top of the food chain strikers like a Lorenz Larkin back in the day. If we look here on the highlights, it's all pretty, uh, for the most part, it's grappling. And that's what he's got to do. He's got to take away the range, the speed, the overall dynamic striking of Ian Gary. If he can close the distance and clinch, push him up against the fence, work for takedowns there, ultimately get a takedown and try and control him on the ground, then I can see a clear path to victory. Now, granted, of course, Ian Gary's at Kilcliffe MMA. As you said, Nick, he's down in Brazil. He's doing the rounds. He's going on tour, so to speak, getting as much training. We all train to defend takedowns. We all train to get back to our feet and we train in jiu-jitsu. These are just everyday parts of mixed martial arts training. So he doesn't really need an entire fight camp dedicated to Neil Magny because we do this thing every day. Like one day we'll focus on boxing, one day we'll focus on jiu-jitsu, one on wrestling, one session we'll be getting back to the feet. So he, he knows how to beat somebody like a Neil Magny, but doing it on the night, that's the hard part. Who imposes the will? And can Neil Magny get in without getting hit? Can he get in and get clinched without eating a straight right, a head kick or whatever? Because that's the danger that Ian Gary has. He's so fast and he's very, very powerful. And I love all the different um, looks and experiences Ian Gary's having. You talked about it, Nick, going to Brazil, training with Charles Oliveira, Diego Lima, and then he's brought Chris Curtis in as well to, to Killcliffe, and he's been working with him. All those different looks and faces have got to be adding to his game as well. Yeah, of course. Listen, there's... It's such a fierce gym. You know, Kill Cliff's one of the best gyms in the world for the reason. And you've got, you know, killers on the mats from this weight division, i.e. Shavkat, Gilbert Burns, two guys who are right there, right on the, the precipice as well. You can't just train with them over and over and over because you will... You know, you'll fall into a certain category. You'll realise actually he's a little bit better than me. He's here. He's a bit further along. Uh, so I think it's good to take a break from a gym like that and go and experience other cultures and other training styles. But I also think coming back to that conversation because of who his coaches are, the Kilkiff coach team, and the exact fact that Neil Magny has been beaten recently by Shavkat and by Gilbert Burns. 
that those coaches know, in theory, they know Neil Magny's style inside and out. So when he comes back in to finish his camp, they can go, right, we know what the game plan is because we've already planned for this guy twice in succession. And it's not like Neil Magny's going to turn up and do something completely different at this stage of his career. Neil Magny is who Neil Magny is. He's a phenomenal fighter. But they've got a game plan that's worked successfully on two occasions. Now it's just about Ian Gary applying his spin on it. Okay, we're talking about the welterweight division. Let's look ahead to a few upcoming events while we have a, a little bit extra break in the action here on the scales. And we're hoping it will be Leon Edwards and Colby Covington in New York in November. But Mike, didn't you say something recently about how John Jones or Colby Covington said John Jones doesn't want to fight on the same card as Colby? And that could mean that fight doesn't So I had a conversation... There. I had an interview with Colby Covington. It's available on my YouTube channel. We went on for about 30 minutes. And that man, listen, Colby Covington, say what you will. He is entertaining. He said a lot of things about John Jones. My word. He holds back no punches. I'm not even going to repeat the things that Colby Covington said. But it was entertaining. Uh, I will tell you this. If John Jones sees him in real life, there may be an issue. And according to Colby, John Jones has requested uh, that he – well, he's apparently told the UFC that he doesn't want to be on the same card as Colby. I don't know if that's true. As I say, Colby Covington is a, uh, a sound bite machine, says a lot of things. They're not all necessarily true. Uh, if you speak to Colby, we're still waiting on Leon Edwards to sign the contract and all the rest of it. I don't think that's the issue at all. I don't think Leon has any reservations about fighting Colby Covington. I'm sure the fight has been rumoured for a very, very long time. Dana announced back in London when Colby was the backup fighter that this will be the fight to go down. Will it be on Madison Square Garden? I hope so for both men and I hope so for Leon Edwards because being a co-main event against Colby Covington with John Jones versus Stipe, which could be a retirement fight for both of the heavyweight legends, that will generate a lot of pay-per-views and that will generate a lot, a massive, massive payday, should I say, for Leon Edwards. He's going to be a rich man after that one, that's for sure. Well, of course, that hasn't quite been announced yet, but we're hoping that goes ahead in New York. But talking of heavyweights in Paris, um, next month in September, we've got Cyril Garn, number two, versus Sergei Spivak, number seven. So we've got two heavyweights going head to head in the main event there, back in Paris. An exciting, right, next fighter to weigh in this morning, the, the other half of the Ultimate Fighter Lightweight oh. Final. Well, we come back Austin to this. I can hear Bud John Anik. Hubbard. Austin Hubbard. Another one of Neil Magny's trainer partners off this card. Released back in 20, 2022. 155, the official weight for Austin Hubbard. You know, yeah, he, he had an up and down career in the UFC. He did pretty well. He won some, he lost some, rebounding now outside of the organization. Right, got two good wins. Competing for the second oh, we've got more. time in as many weeks, live on pay per view in the Bantamweight division. Oh, Devon Blackshear. Blackshear. Good lad. Oh, I ah, actually, I forgot he hadn't weighed in yet. So we've got three more still. So he fought one week ago, and here he is back on the scales. Yeah, and it's a big opportunity for him. You know, I mean, he's not, probably not a name that most people are familiar with. Now he gets a spotlight on a main card pay-per-view. A lot of people are going to know him if he can go out there and beat Mario Batista, as we said, stylistically, a tough matchup. The official weight for the monster, Damon Blackshear. Good for him. But it's a it. massive opportunity for yeah. him. Yeah. How impressive is that, though? A week later, making weight, 135.5 there. And like you said, a huge opportunity. Well, all right, it's so double bubble. You're getting paid <laughs> two two purses for one training camp. Anytime yep. you can do that, do it. You know what I'm saying? Especially when I go, he got a quick win. He got a quick twist. They took him down. Didn't take any damage whatsoever. So he was golden. He was good to go. All he's got to do is diet a little bit and then get right back in there in a sport that he loves on a main card pay-per-view. I mean, it's a massive opportunity. And as I say, two paydays for one training camp. It's simple math. Even Nick P could get that answer right. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be thinking about another Jump bonus. There. That's what he'll be thinking about. He's made 50 grand last week bonus, and he'll be looking to make another 50 grand bonus this weekend. 
what a fortnight it could be for Mr. Blackshear. Absolutely. All right, back to Paris and our heavy hitters, Mike. Yeah, listen, Cyril Garn. I mean, we love Cyril Garn. What a human being he is and what a fighter. Moves like a middleweight. We know this. The kickboxing is beautiful. Last time out in Paris, he set that building on fire. I mean, look, you wouldn't think he was the main, the main man representing Paris. There he is taking out the former champ, Junior Dos Santos. He's got submissions as well. Tied to a Barca in Paris last year. Look at that. What a finish. The way he uses the footwork to pivot out of the way and then just goes to town on Tied to a Barca. But he's rebounding. He lost against John Jones. He was taken down and choked out pretty quickly. And on these highlights from Sergei Spivak, that is something that Sergei Spivak can do. He's got tremendous jiu-jitsu and he's getting better and better. Listen, this is a tough match for Cyril Garn. Stylistically, um, um, Sergei Spivak has all the tools and all the skills to really upset everybody in Paris. This is not an easy fight and it's not a gimme for Cyril Garn. This is not a fight where they're saying, listen, Cyril Garn's a big star. He's got the, the Paris, uh, sorry, the French audience resting on his shoulders. Let's give him an easy fight. No, this is a real fight with <sighs> potentially potentially bad uh, ramifications. It's still early. I need more coffee, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> we still got an hour to go, as I was reminded of a moment ago. Oh, my word. Get on the scale. <laughs> Ian Gary, have a word. Stop doing social media videos. Stop winding up Neil Magdy. Get on the scale, lads. Let's go. As He's you say, Mike, just the difference... The still this morning. Oh, he's making TikToks or something, yeah? The difference here in this opponent for Paris, for Cyril Garn, compared to last year, yes, Taito Avasa is beloved the world over, the full shoey bit, everything else. We love Ty, and I'm no doubt in Sydney he will blow the roof off once again. But Taito Avasa turned up in Paris with one game plan, because he has one game plan for every single fight. I will punch you in the face and knock you out. All I've got to do is land clean and I'll finish you. The difference here is Sergei Spivak turns up in Paris. Yeah, I've got power. I could, If I land, I can seriously hit you. I've also got excellent takedowns. I've also got legitimate ground game. You know, he's coming off a wonderful arm triangle submission from February. That was a performance of the night bonus. When you look at his record, Spivak, seven knockouts, seven submissions. He is a fully well-rounded mixed martial artist, and he won't be standing in front of Cyril Gann, letting Cyril Gann tee off, looking to try and counter land a big bomb opportunity. He'll be waiting for Cyril Gann to commit to his offense and then shooting a double, shooting a single leg, taking him down, silencing that crowd. You're right, Mike, this is a completely different animal. And ever since that loss to Tom Aspinall, he has been on fire. Three wins, back-to-back, -back, all finishes, inside two rounds. Spivak is a legit, real threat. And he could, uh, I, honestly, that Paris crowd in a couple of weeks, he could be silenced. I can't wait we to be there have because... also very interesting... Go ahead, Caroline. Sorry, yeah, we keep talking over each other with the delay. No, I was saying we also have a very interesting co-main event. Sorry to move us on, Mike, but we have Rose Namayunas moving up to 125 pounds and taking on Manon, uh, Manon Firo. Uh, so 125, number two ranked in Firo and number two ranked strawweight um, in Rose. Interesting matchup, Mike. What, how do you think Rose is going to do at 125 pounds? I mean, listen, I think she can do just fine. You know, she's an incredible fighter, you know, former champion. She's had some legendary bouts inside the octagon. Very forgettable last time out against Carla Esparza. But look at this, Manon Fioro, right? She's going to be the favourite, obviously, coming in into Paris. She's French. She's an incredible fighter, right? Since she burst on the scene in the UFC, I knew she was destined for big things. She's an incredible kickboxer and a big opportunity here. Rose Namajunas. Anyone that watches the sport of mixed martial arts, they know the name Rose Namajunas. She's had some legendary fights, beating some Yo Joanna Young Jacek. I mean, some crazy fights. The knockout over Zhang Weili, who's the champion currently, you know. But there's a reason she's moving up to 125, probably getting a little bit older. She's struggling and lost some fights right now. Now, this is a way for her to reinvent herself. But it's a tough night at the office against Manon Fioro because she's bigger, she's powerful, and she has all the skills to stand there and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Rose Namajunas. She wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Rose Namajunas. So, tough fight for both ladies, and I'm very intrigued by it. And Nick, of course, Fioro will have that home crowd Paris support behind her as well. 
Yeah, and listen, we were blessed enough to be in Paris last year and the atmosphere was absolutely incredible. And I would hazard a guess, she's never fought in France before. Of course, the sport only, only legalised there a couple of years ago. She's been on the road. She's been building this incredible record. You know, she's got one loss on her record and that actually came on her pro debut in Cage Warriors against Liam McCourt, Molly McCann's training partner. Since then, you know, nine straight wins, tons of knockout finishes in there you know she looks like she's going to be a future title contender if not a champion in this weight division but look at it the other way around she's going in against a girl in rose that's been a champion on two separate occasions that has got so much more experience than her that is more than capable of standing on her feet with her but also fully capable of taking her down and giving her a real hard time on the ground so what last year felt like the greatest night in the history of french mma could quickly this year become a real depressing night in the history of French MMA because both these French superstars could easily, very easily, legitimately lose and lose in style. And that's always the risk, isn't it? Because remember when the UFC came back uh, to London last year in March, what an event that was. I mean, it was sensational. That's why the UFC, like, we've got to come back. And they did, you know, but we've had some great events, but we've had some slower ones as well. Because when the expectations are that high, when everyone's getting yeah. finished in every fight, the crowd are losing their mind. It's going to be hard to top what we had last year in Paris. Start to finish, the energy was ridiculous. It was packed from the opening fight. The first prelim, the place was packed, and they were all excited. I ran past the arena earlier in the day, and there was hundreds, if not thousands, of fans all outside the arena. So it's going to be an incredible night. And if Cyril Garn can pull it off, man man you know i mean the star will continue to rise it will indeed and i love all the european fight nights the crowd certainly brings it but moving us across the world to sydney for ufc 293 september the 9th um indeed israel adesanya in his part of the world will be taking on Sean Strickland. That was recently announced. We thought it would be Drickus Duplessis. He's not able to compete. It's Sean Strickland. Mike, I want your rundown on, firstly, how we think the, the kind of build-up will go between the two of them. Sean certainly always having a lot to say. And then, of course, the fight. Well, Izzy said that he had to convince the UFC because they were worried that he would uh, say something too controversial and the, the Australians wouldn't like it. I don't think the UFC care. They never tell anyone what to say. And Sean Strickland's going to sell the fight. Listen, he's, he's already he's calling him a lot of names. He's always going at Israel Adesanya for his love of anime, calling him the Chinese champion. He's out of his mind, but he shows up to fight. I mean, last time out against Ibis Magomedov, he looked the best version of himself, and that's what sealed him this fight. I think he's outmatched on the feet, you know, and that's no shock. Israel Adesanya is an incredible kickboxer. That's why he's the champion of the world. Uh, but he's also got great takedown defense. Sean Strickland's a really good grappler, high, high level jujitsu, but the wrestling isn't as good. So I don't think he's going to be able to take him down. I think he's going to walk Izzy down, and that's what he's got to do, take away that reach and that range. But I think I think Israel Adesanya is going to have way too much. He's going to have fun at the press conference. He's going to have fun with Sean all week, and he's probably going to have the most fun when it comes to fight night. And Nick, of course, Sean Strickland coming off a really good win over Abbas Megamedov. Um, really impressive in that fight. He's got some nice momentum behind him. What's he got to do? Um, turn up like he did that night, you know, and throw real momentum and get Izzy into corners and get Izzy doesn't necessarily want to be and don't allow himself to be pulled up into the, into the tight clinch and just let his hands go because there's no pressure on him whatsoever. You know, it's not just in Australia where it is, he's a huge favourite. He'll be a huge favourite globally as well because he is running through this division multiple times and Sean Strickland is kind of like, well, okay, it's some fresh meat. Let's throw him in there. What he can't do is turn up like he did against Alex Bahia and just stand right in front of Izzy and allow himself to be teed off on because if he does that, you know, it's similar to that fight. He, he's just, he just won't get the minutes and he won't get the rounds in. It's a big ask for Sean Strickland, it really is. But, you know, we, we talked about it earlier on with the, with the co-main event in Boston this weekend with Lemos. If Sean, this could be Sean Strickland's only world title fight of his entire UFC career. It may only come now. And it's about grasping it with both hands and not leaving anything left in there and, and having the right game plan 
to unlock something in Israel Adesanya which he can absolutely exploit. He's got to get him down. He's got to get that ground and pound going. He's got to try and put Izzy in uncomfortable situations because if he can put it on Izzy, and we've seen it done before. We've seen it with done with Kelvin Gastelum a couple of years ago where Izzy ended up having a war with him. That's the kind of fight that Sean Strickland needs to be begging for and driving for because if it becomes a war, if it becomes a, who wants it most, in the pocket, then Strickland's got a real chance of causing a seismic upset in this sport. But he's got to get Izzy into that position first. That's down to his coaches, his game planning, and really putting it on Izzy and trying to silence that crowd. It's going to be a tough week for him. But you know what? I think Sean Strickland will probably love every minute because he's a sandwich short of a picnic, isn't he? <laughs> well, on the scales now, Neil Magny weighing in. Bit of concern on his face there. Yeah, well, this was short notice. There he is. All good there. I, I, I mean, as good. you there were we saying, Nick, about the Sean Strickland and the Israel Adesanya fight, the two human beings, and the two human beings that know how to fight, that train all the time, and Sean Strickland deserves this spot. Granted, it's kind of through default because Izzy's been through everybody and he needs fresh meat. However, as I say, he's earned it and he's a human being, right? And he's a fighter and he's world-class. So if Izzy, you know, underestimates him ever so slightly, which I don't think he will because he's a true professional, but, but as I say, you land one good shot that can change the tide. It can change the course, you know, so you can't underestimate him. Listen, Sean will be a massive underdog, but anything can happen. I was a 10 to one underdog when I beat Rockhold. We've seen upsets all the time. And Kelvin Gastelum, as you say, that fight, I mean, that showed Izzy is human. He can be beaten. Correct. He can be hurt. He can be finished like we saw against Alex Pereira as well. And look at these back-to-back -back opponents stepping onto the scale. There we go. Last the fight is efficient. Last fight on fighter on the scale, Ian Gary. We've lost audio here. Neil Magny was 170.5. I'll wait to hear what Ian Gary weighed in. He's got a smile on his face, though. They've obviously made weight. Just interesting that both of them so, yeah. have taken, you know, an hour and 20 minutes to make weight back to back. Very strange. Maybe there was some psychology going on in the uh in the last man out of the sauna, Mike. Do you think it was a last man out the sauna job? <laughs> nah, I don't think so. And, and given the back and forth this week, I doubt they're sharing a sauna. I doubt they're sitting at each other, you know what I mean? Jabbing at each other verbally in the sauna whilst cutting weight. You don't want to see your opponent. You don't want to see anyone. You don't want to speak to anyone, let alone your opponent. Uh, I love the conspiracy. I love how deep and mysterious your mind works. But I think that's what you call a good old fashioned coincidence. Correct. Well, that was 170.5 as well for Ian Machado, Gary. So exactly the same. As Neil Magny, every single fighter has weighed in. They are on weight. Our whole UFC 292 card is complete. Mike, we'll let you go shortly and have a, a bit of a nap or another coffee, whatever it is you need early on there over in, in California. But let's get some final thoughts on, first of all, our main event, the bantamweight title on the line between Aljamain Sterling and Sugar Sean O'Malley. Mike. Yeah, look, listen, it's going to be a great fight. Sean O'Malley brings it every time. Now, you can discredit his opponents like Aljamain Sterling has done. That's what you need to do. But the last one, you're only as good as your last fight, and that was against Piotr Jan. Can he stop the takedown? That's what we're talking about here. Can we stop the takedown? And we're going to see that pretty early. Aljamain's not going to mess around. He's not bothered. He's not trying to prove anything. He doesn't let all the negativity and all the hatred affect how he fights. And he set his stall out. He said, listen, I'm going to take you down. They, were, they had this $100 bet as to who's going to go for a takedown first. Aljamain even joked and said, well, does a, does a body lock count as shooting? Because it doesn't. Uh, he's going to go in there. He's going to try and take him down. So we're going to know very quickly, about a minute into the fight, and if Al, sorry, if Sean can stop that first takedown, oh ho, that's where the intensity and that's where the interest steps up a notch because it's like, look at that, he stopped the first takedown. But if he can't, if he gets taken down, if he gets ragdolled like Al Jermaine predicts, then uh, I think we're going to see and still. 
Mm, who will impose their will first? And then Nick in the co-main event, another title on the line in the strawweight division with Zhang Wei Li, one of your favorite fighters, taking on Amanda Lemosh. Final thoughts? I think it's going to be explosive. I think it's going to steal the show. I think it's going to be something quite special because Amanda Lemos, as we pointed out earlier, this is it, kid. This is your entire life. Your entire professional fighting career comes down to 25 minutes in Boston tomorrow night, and she is going to deliver. She's going to step up. She's going to let her hands go as she always does, and it's about can she land that killer blow? But also, in the opposite corner, I think you've got a girl, a champion, sorry, in Wiley, that is just a level above in every single department. Physically, her IQ, uh, a grasp of mixed martial arts, her transitions from one style to another. I think she'll take Lee Moss for a ride. I think she'll dominate on the ground. I think she could even dominate with the stand-up as well. Lee Moss going to have her moments. Both these girls are going to be hurt. The cards are going to be all over the place. But I think, unlike the main event, I think we are definitely getting a finish and I think we could see Wiley once again rubber stamp herself as one of mm. the best fighters in the sport today. All right, well, let's take a final look at our main card. It kicks off in the bantamweight division. Marlon Vera taking on Pedro Munoz. There be wanting to put on a show. Another bantamweight fight between Damon Blackshear stepping in on a week's notice against Mario Bautista. And then our welterweight bout. Neil Magny, again, last minute step in for him against Ian Machado Gary. And our two title fights, starting with the women's strawweight title, Zhang Weili defending against Amanda Lemos. And then the piece de la resistance of the night, the bantamweight title fight, the cherry on top of the cake, if you like, Aljamain Sterling making his fourth title defense against Sean O'Malley with his first ever five round fight this will all kick off on tnt sports one prelim starting at 1 a.m and the main card from three tnt sports one and discovery plus enjoy